<laughs> all right, now we got some work to do. Oh. Yeah, it's time. Now that we should be doing <laughs> At this point, I would like to open up the meeting to the public. If there's anybody who has any questions or concerns they'd like to share with us, we will have another opportunity at the end of the meeting. No? All right. All right. Thank you very much. Moving right along, we'll move on to the superintendent's report, Mr. Dooley. Okay. Yeah, I got a couple of items. Uh, the first one, um, I sat with Coach Fraunhofer, Mr. Fraunhofer, he talked about a wrestling camp that he's going to be offering here in Salem on the from July 24th to the 28th. <coughs> his, um, his cousin, Van, who was the head coach at Columbia University, is going to come in and work the camp. And also, um, Trevor LeBlanc's brother, Ryan, who's the head coach at Citadel is going to be working the camp. And, and you know, Mr. Fraunhofer is very excited. I, w I was so excited to hear about this because what a great opportunity for the Salem Cambridge kids and also kids from around the area. It will be free to the Salem Cambridge kids and anybody out of the area think they're going to charge like $50. The only cost for the district or for Coach Fraunhofer will be paying for Bands and, and Ryan's air flight, so they're not charging anything. So uh, I was so excited about the camp that I forgot to put it on the board agenda. <laughs> so I would ask that if the board is in agreement, I think it's a, a great opportunity for our wrestlers and just goes to show you again how Salem is very, very special to be able to offer something like this. So um, if you're willing to approve that, that would be great. We'll put it on at the end of the action. Okay. Um, and uh, the second item, I just wanted to touch base with you. You may have been reading about the change in the open meetings law uh, and the new regulation. Go, we don't, there's a lot of confusion out there. Um, it, so we're, we're, we have a reprieve for 60 days or until June, I think it's June 8th is the actual date. Everything can remain as seen, but um, we will get guidance from Gerben and Falazzo. Um, once they work with SED and all the people to uh, get things exactly figured out how it should be. You know, one of the things they talked about that board members could only pre be, uh, participate from the outside if there's an extraordinary event. Well, what is an extraordinary event? And trying to get clarification a disability, an illness, um, providing care to a relative or, you know, it's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that seem to be ambiguous in, in the regulation as it currently is, uh, has been presented. So uh, we'll be getting more and I would say that uh, by the next board meeting or, or by the June board meeting, um, hopefully we'll have some documents <coughs> that can a recommendation to, um, to, uh, for, the, for the board to consider um, moving forward with that. So I wanted to share that with you. The last piece of information I wanted to share with you, we're in baseball season. Uh, the season's going very well for baseball, softball, varsity, JV, modified. They've, they've had some games. We're excited about that. Um, I just wanted to update you where we are with the baseball on that, and I'm, I'm disappointed. Um, I knew we would not have the baseball on that up, by, um, by the spring season, I was hopeful that it would be up by this summer. I had a conversation with our architect yesterday, and it just went to SED yesterday. And I informed you that it went to SED in December, and apparently it did not. And I, uh, I voiced my displeasure about that, but, um, but so it will be a minimum of 10 to 12 weeks at SED getting a review, so I would not anticipate that net being up there before the fall. I did have a conversation with our neighbor, and I assured him that it, there will be a net, and it will be of quality, and will protect his pool and his grandchildren and anybody else that happens to be there. Um, Paul, our, 
Yakubek was at a game, watched a JV game, and he saw a kid from home plate hit the fence in the air, the pool fence. Mm -hmm. So it's certainly something that, that we need, and I'm disappointed it's not going to be up earlier, but uh, I just wanted you to be aware of that. So if you hear any questions, or if you hear that the district is not going to be doing it, that's untrue. We are going to do it, and hopefully we'll be taken care of. We'll do it as quickly as we can, but not in the time that we had hoped um, earlier. So that concludes my report, and we'll have our principals. Uh, Mr. Cronin, you want to begin? Certainly. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duty. I notice in the uh, minutes that I'm being appointed this evening and I want to thank you. I knew when we talked in November you said you needed some time to think about it and <laughs> I'm glad it came to fruition. The probationary period has been completed. You've done an extraordinary job and I'm, I fully recommend Mr. Cronin for this appointment. There's no hesitation whatsoever. Everybody seems to be pointing out my mistakes tonight. I'm not having a good night. <laughs> Very critical. Uh, our, we're undergoing our New York State math assessments um, in grades three through six, which begin tomorrow. Um, Mrs. Adams started today with seven, eight. Uh, upcoming dates I thought the board should be aware of. May 5th, we're hosting parent night, parent information night, parents only, for incoming pre-K and incoming kindergarten. That'll be at 5.30 and 6.30. May 13th. We're screening all day students, all day, the students who attended pre-K and getting ready for kindergarten. And the following Monday, May 16th, we're screening incoming students who did not attend pre-K. So that was the f May 13th and 16th. Uh, Mr. Duty asked me to speak about the clubs we have in the uh, elementary school <coughs> regarding the clubs. K-6, we have student council. There's 24 elementary members, and that is organized and supervised by Tina Lukbeck. And they conduct morning announcements and announce recognize people's birthdays, both staff and students. <coughs> they conduct fundraising projects, most recently for the Hebron Camp Food Pantry. They assist with tours of the building for new students, and they also assist Coach Parker on the upcoming field days. That's just to name a few of the things they do. We also have a Cool to be Kind club. It's a proactive social group for the interested children in grades four through six. Currently have 20 students. They're organized, supervised by Mrs. Quack and Mrs. Keenan. They meet once a week and come up with random ideas and acts of kindness that'll help the students and staff stay in a positive framework. Some of the examples, they post post-it notes in the hallways just saying smile, be kind, thank your neighbor, thank your teacher. At Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays, they sent thank yous to the members of the maintenance staff and to the bus drivers and dropped them off treats. They made up posters for teachers during Teachers Appro Appreciation Week. So we try and be all positive in, in the groups, and they have done a wonderful job, and I want to thank those members who organized them. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Ms. Adams? Just getting my list here. Oh. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, a few of our updates for the high school, uh, in addition to, so we're also administering the math 7-8 uh, today and tomorrow we'll have makeups uh, at the end of the week. We um, had no opt-outs uh, for, we had a few kids who were absent for uh, the ELA, and so I'm not sure, but as of right now, I think we have a very similar situation. So we've had a very 
strong participation rate. And once we're through the um, final week of testing, then we'll give you some participation rates, but very encouraged by that. Um, we did try to encourage our families to um, you know, consider that this is really helpful in us uh, being able to really know where um, students are with their uh, foundational skills in ELA and math and uh, will really help us do some planning for next year in terms of kind of filling those COVID gaps. So uh, we're hoping to get some good information from the testing. So May is a busy month. So as you know, end of the year is very busy at the high school. AP exams uh, will be administered the first two weeks of May. They're returning to paper and pencils. So they did during COVID offer online exams and we are returning to paper and pencil. Um, and uh, we anticipate that most of our students are going to participate in the exams. But again, once we, um, you know, administer the exams, we'll share those participation rates with you. Also, uh, National Honor Society, so they're very busy uh, currently, and so they're uh, returning to the annual spelling bee this year. There will be a regional uh, spelling <coughs> bee, so they will be running the annual spelling bee for grades five and six on Friday, May 6th. So um, elementary uh, classrooms will be kind of running some preliminary uh, contest and then they'll send uh, each class will send I think two or three finalists to uh, mm -hmm. the final round which we'll have in the auditorium so that's pretty exciting uh, we're also preparing for senior prom uh, Saturday May 14th so as you are aware last year we did not have normally we have a junior prom this year um, it will be a senior prom there was some discussion about last year we had no proms um, well actually we had prom which was a senior prom for the previous junior class who did not have it so um, we did not have a junior prom last year this year we will have the seniors once again a senior prom there was some discussion about holding a junior and senior prom to get back on track but the junior class was a little short they fell on their funds and um you know the clubs are uh run That's a lot of the decisions are made by the students and um the both classes there was some discussion between them and they did not want to have a combined prom this year um but there was discussion that the 10th and the 11th grade, current 10th and 11th grade would have a combined prom next year. So it'll be a junior senior prom. So then the following year we can get back on the junior prom schedule. So I know it's a little confusing, but everyone's going to be covered in the, in the prom um, scheduling over the next few years. So it'll take us a few years to get back on track. But um, we're anticipating uh, our coronation to be at 5 o'clock. So uh, May 14th is the senior prom on Saturday. So coming up in a few weeks, I believe there's some discussion about that um, kind of changing the tradition of coronation. They li I think a lot of people liked the arrival in the circle last year. I don't know how many of you saw that, but I, I did, did not ever see it in the archway. But I think a lot of people liked that you could see everybody lined up and coming in. And so I think there's been some discussion with the senior class of continuing um, with this location on the circle if the weather is good and then moving um, the ceremony as tradition into the auditorium. So just a new twist on the transit on the tradition. Harder to get the bigger tractors through the archway. Right, space. right, yeah. So, so right, there, I think there was a lot more opportunity for different vehicles. Um, so yes, I was telling Mr. Duty, it was, it's very, it's, it's very exciting to see, so. Um, I think it'll be it'll be nice and it'll be nice to kind of re resume our normal um, kind of operation of the prom and having the coronation and the auditorium decorated. Uh, we, I also just wanted to know and recognize the after prom committee um, for their work uh, in planning the after prom. This year it will be at Sky Zone in Glens Falls. Again, um, some of the venues are very limited because a lot of events over the past two years have been canceled, so now everything's becoming rescheduled. Uh, and so we've had discussions about really starting our planning for next year, working with the after prom committee um, 
to do that. And then uh, just I'll remind you at our next board meeting, but uh, annual day of service, we're returning to that in the community. So we've ordered our t-shirts. That's going to be Thursday, May 19th. It is, um, you know, quite a big uh, process for planning. So the National Honor Society has taken that over as a kind of their capstone project of the year. So we appreciate that as well. And finally, I just want to let you know, I'm not sure you've seen on Facebook. So we did um, yesterday, we announced uh, our top 10 uh, in school. And so we have all this a little process where we call the top 10 students down and I give them a little candle for their graduation cake with their number. And uh, we do some photos and um, Mrs. Hoffer is um, doing the countdown. It was just another tradition that we kind of thought we had a lot of positive feedback last year. So yesterday she started with number 10 and then each day for the, uh, this week and next week we'll announce um, our top 10 students. And then shortly thereafter we'll, we're working on our press release and the um, little bios and uh, a little more information about each student. So that will be coming along. That was, you will notice, a little different. A lot, we uh, in the past have put that in the budget newsletter, but just with the timing of the end of the third quarter, which is when we, that's when the final um, averages are calculated, and the timing of the newsletter needing to be at the print shop and then put in the mail to be in compliance with, um, you know, the timing uh, that we need to have for the budget. It just did not work this year, so we'll, we'll have uh, some other ways to recognize our students. Okay, so we'll keep you posted on that. Any questions? Is the problem here? Like, are we doing the test like we did? Or no, back uh, Fort William Henry. Okay. Yep, so back up there. And then, um, yes, and they're, they're working on their selection of their venue for next year. Yeah, so just the coronation will be here, and then they'll um, they have the buses, and we'll, they'll be bussed up, um, go to after prom, and then be bussed back. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Cole, anything you want to share with the board? <clears throat> yep. So, uh, for one, it's exciting that it is now getting warmer out, nicer <laughs> out, spring sports. Everybody is super excited and just loving that. Um, you know, spirits have definitely been raised uh, since it was cold out, since the winter time, you know. Things are really uh, flipping around, and that's very exciting. Um, something that I brought up at the last meeting, um, but it really hasn't left my mind, um, is uh, teen nicotine addiction. Um, right now, most of the people that you see my age are addicted to nicotine. Uh, vaping, chances are, you know, at least half the kids you talk to have one in their pocket. Um, now, this is unsettling news, you know. Uh, nobody wants to hear about their youth being addicted to, uh, you know, these chemicals. And um, so I've really been thinking about it a lot, you know. And, you know, so since the last board meeting as well, I managed to quit nicotine myself. And I realized by doing that that it is possible for anybody to uh, to put that down. So um, you know, uh, Mr. Duty and I have been talking. Uh, we've been in contact with Hudson Headwaters. Um, this is something that I'm very passionate about um, because I think that you know. It's hard, it's a really hard subject because it's not very, um, you know, widely talked about, you know. It's very, um, you know, kind of hush-hush, um, you know, because people don't want to, you know. So, anyway, I think that, um, you know, it would be good to start opening up this conversation because I think that that really has a big impact on, you um, you know the tide of things so since I quit nicotine I uh, started to see you know a couple other uh, people around me starting to do the same thing 
now, you know, and that's not to, you know, put credit towards myself, but, you know, I realized something because one of my friends that has quit just recently, just in this past couple weeks, um, he said that one of the biggest things that helped him was the fact of us talking about it and the fact that that was an idea that was in his head, you know, and ever since he talked about that, um, ever since we talked about that, you know, it was something that, that stayed on his mind and this was a while ago. This is while I was still uh, using that too. So, um, you know, I would, I would be willing to, um, you know, s start to, you know, talk to people about this. You know, maybe I can help out with uh, uh, Hudson Headwaters. Um, and I think that a student perspective on this uh, situation is very important, um, you know, because, you know, there's a lot of prevention programs, but, you know, people don't realize that it is possible for them to put this down, and it is possible, you know, and if they see somebody else that's done it, you know, that's going to be an idea in their heads, too. So I think... You know, we have the ball rolling, and I think that this is something really positive that can be, um, I think we can make an impact here, you know, and it's going to start here, you know, and it's going to take effort, but, you know, whether it's a couple or a ton of kids, you know, that are thinking about quitting, you know, I think that that's something that's good, so I'd like some you know, feedback. I'm, I'm curious what everybody here thinks about that or any questions, you know. I, just to update the board, I did reach out to Hudson Headwaters and they would like to partner with us on, on some type of vaping program. As I mentioned to Cole, I think one of the, the first things is to raise our staff members' awareness mm -hmm. and begin there and then, and then certainly branch out. Um, I did say to Cole, you know, I live right across the street from a school. There's a basketball court, and there's all these 15, 20 kids, and I, now I watch, and I see the pus. And there's, you know, high school kids, and there's elementary kids, and, and I, I watch now, and I look for it, and it's regular. So I just think we got to raise people's awareness. And, and parents of little kids who are sending their, you know, child to the, basketball court play basketball should be aware of what's going on in certain ways. So I thank Paul for that and I think it's something we should look at. Yeah. Um, yeah, parents and staff, you know, especially parents because um, personally that was never, you know, accepted in my family, you know, and, and my parents were never smokers. Um, so that was something that was very, you know, so I didn't talk about that for a long time, and it's been years that I've been doing that. But um, it was once I was able to, you know, I started to be more open with some of my teachers, and I decided to open up to my parents about it. And it's really the openness that um, really helps out on this whole thing, you know, because kids feel like they can't um, talk to people about it. Um, you know, because, I mean, you know, you get caught, you know, at school and you get in trouble and then your parents are mad at you. And then after that, you just say, oh, well, you know, it was friends that I was, you know, or I'm not addicted. It was just a one-time thing. And then this issue continues to go on and on, um, you know. So it's, you know, if you, you know, I don't know. It's it's a big thing, you know. I've been really putting a lot of thought into it, um, you know. But I think we need to kind of start to open up our community's eyes, um, because right now the whole world's eyes are closed to this. So, I think that we can really make something change here. It's going to take everybody's combined uh, effort and acceptance and awareness for this, though. And it does sound like it needs to be two-pronged, one to deal with the students that are currently using and one to keep students from starting. Yes, so it does sound absolutely. like it needs to be a, a two-pronged Absolutely. Approach. Yes. <coughs> yeah, I'm in, I'm in full support. Yes, yeah, there's power and knowledge and 
you know, not all of us. I mean, I our last meeting that brought a lot of awareness and mm -hmm. eye opening. I did not know what they looked like, so did some research. You know, looking up and it's just crazy. So you know, I'm full support of whatever we can do to partner with Hudson Headwaters and get the ball rolling. No, I really appreciate and impressed with your candor on this subject, and I and I think it really has helped. I mean, it's been eye opening. Yeah. I think to all of us, but definitely to me. Yeah. And uh, and I think that's 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 great. I mean, thank you for for bringing this to us. Of course, of course, mm -hmm. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, I um, think hopefully maybe we can even become a bit of a model for other schools. To, right. To hopefully use. That's, to. I'll follow up with Hudson Headwaters. It's been a few weeks now, mm -hmm. and, and I know. That yeah, good people. So I'll follow up to see what, what their thoughts are. Yeah, thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. so, yep. We're all finished. Thank you, Cole. Yeah, thank, okay. you. thank you. Thank you. Okay. And uh, we have another yeah. presentation. Uh, Mr. Moore is going to put on an athletic presentation. Um, it's been two years that really, you know, interscholastic athletics have, were real, either non existent or and limited, so we're back in full swing. One of the things that we did work on this year was a yearly calendar of events for the Board of Education. We put in there an athletic update. So uh, Ms. Adams and I have worked with, with Mr. Moore and given him some topics that, you know, that I think you might be interested in. So he has certainly uh, prepared that and open for any questions. So we'll turn things over to our Athletic director, Mr. Moore, and I'll get some lights over here. I'll put them No. Sorry, use the clicker. All right, so just in case you didn't know, I'm Will Moore, and I'm the athletic director. This is my first year of my second stint. I've been the athletic director before. That was probably seven or eight years ago. Uh, so tonight, you know, if the president has a state of the union, I look at this as kind of the state of Salem sports uh, in its current iteration. All right, so right now, going to next year, 2022-2023, we are still, we're offering boys and girls soccer, field hockey, football, golf, uh, and anything that has an asterisk next to it, those are, those are teams that we are merged with Cambridge. Uh, next year will be the first year that we are merged in boys soccer. So that'll be something new coming, uh, coming in August. And you can see, I mean, everything else, boys basketball, girls basketball, everything is pretty much the same. And then the merge teams we have at Cambridge. So football, we've been merged for eight years now. Golf has been two years. Wrestling is seven years. Field hockey, four years. This is our first year that we've merged in baseball. And boys soccer, as I said, in the fall, it'll be the first time that we, um, we have that as a merged sport. Some of the accomplishments of this year, just you know, team and individual. This year, uh, we had 15 kids that made the uh, scholar-athlete team for the state. Uh, we had the Salem-Cambridge field hockey team, which was a, a scholar-athlete team, meaning 75% of the team had an average 90 or above. Uh, in field hockey, Mary-Kate McPhee was named to the all-state team. Uh, in girls soccer, Katie Sweener, was earned, she earned Class D goalkeeper of the year in Section 2. Um, Amber Terry and Connor Chilson were both all-stars, second team for the Adirondack League. Uh, the Salem-Cambridge wrestling team finished third in Section 2 in Class D. And then Lucas Martindale finished second in Section 2. And Evan Day, who is a Cambridge student of our merged team, uh, finished third in the state wrestling tournament. So there's a lot of things that you know we've been able to accomplish uh, this year and currently our baseball team and our, our merge baseball team and our softball team are both currently undefeated in league. So, you know, we've, we've done a lot of great things uh, this year so far, and hopefully there's more. Uh, just some data. If we look at student athlete participation, uh, you can see here in the fall, it's divided into seventh and, you know, seven through 12. 
and here is that part, and then here is the part where we have students that are not playing sports in the fall. In the winter, obviously, it's the same thing, and you can see because we only have three sports, it's 67 percent that are not participating in the sport. And this this spring, we've had, you know, it's right here. We have 40 percent of the students that are playing sports, and then 60 percent that are not. Well, if yes, you just go, the spring sports. So if you go to the top of the seventh grade, yep. That's the seventh grade. Yes. Blue is the eighth grade. Yes. It goes ninth. It goes grade right home, down the line down here. The senior, so you can kind of get an idea. Um, I had a conversation today um, with Gina, and I think it's what sixty-four percent of your kids are not participating in a sport, and you know she kind of thought that was high, and um, it's been my experience that if if you have 25% of your kids participating in a sport, that's fairly good. So, I, I, you know, I, we want more kids involved. Your participation level probably across the state is not terrible. It might be, you know, and that's, I think that's some data that we may want to try to compare. Well, and we I know want to increase, but when I was, sorry to interrupt, when I was the AD the last time, our participation rate was probably 30 to 31 percent. Uh, right now, this year, it's 39 percent. So it has at least gone up, but we still have, as you said, 60 percent of the kids that are not participating in the sport in any three seasons. So the, here we have student participation. 26% of students only play one sport the whole year. 21% play two sports, and 16% of our student body, 7 through 12, playing three sports. And there's that number that I just gave you, that total participation is 39% uh, this year, which, like I said, is an improvement, but I would like to see it uh, get better. And, and if I can just yep. that 16% in three sports, you know, that, that was a worthy goal to try to increase that, you know, to 20%. You know, districts this size and, and bigger, you need three sport athletes. There's, you, you, got, you got to have more two, two sport athletes, but if you can get three sports, because it benefits kids. And um, so that, that's a worthy goal. And if you try to, why, are, why is a kid only playing one sport? Right. And, and I've said this many times to, to a lot of students here, and I've said at orientations, I went to school in Saratoga Springs, and I love sports, but unless I'm the best of the best, odds of me playing a sport in Saratoga are not likely. And here in Salem, you know, I don't think kids appreciate the opportunity that they have, that they can play practically any sport. We're always looking for numbers, uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's a great benefit to kids, but, you know, that's how we got to figure out how to try to sell that to them. Uh, if you look, participation by grade in the purple is basically telling you, and this is just one sport, is telling you uh, in the seventh grade that 28 out of 45 kids, purple is the kids that are actually in sports and then the to out of the total enrollment per grade. Um, so, you know, you can see in eighth grade, you know, most of them are at least playing one sport, but it seems like as you get higher up, uh, that it does seem to be dropping off a little bit. Uh, so one of the things, a couple things that I wanted to go over just because, you know, maybe some people don't know how it works is, is the merger process, how we work on getting a merge. You know, we look at the numbers obviously are the most important thing. Last, last fall we lost our soccer, our boys soccer team because we did not have enough players to field the team, so we had to cancel the whole season. Uh, so that was obviously so next year now we're merged in, in soccer so we're that you know that was our, our remedy to try to to uh, get the numbers up there and and actually have a team so that was the best route you know that's happened in foot it happened in football it's happened in wrestling you know we're we're trying to create uh, an, a place where kids can play any sport they want at the levels they want Last year when we played baseball uh, last spring, you know, we had like 10 or 11 kids, 9 through 12, playing varsity baseball. Whereas a ninth grader probably isn't ready for varsity baseball, 
but he had to play a varsity baseball because that's what we had and we didn't have the numbers. So this allows us, the merger process in general, gives us an opportunity to put kids at the proper level and also probably obviously cuts down a frustration of a kid in ninth grade that's trying to play varsity baseball and it's just not, he's not ready for that yet. So the merger process is a great benefit to uh, smaller school districts like this one and a lot of districts uh, in Washington County are, are merging uh, these days. But the merger process, so basically we decide the number, uh, you know, based on numbers, we reach out to a school that's geographically close, as luck would have it, we have, you know, Cambridge is just, you know, 10 minutes down the road. So they seem like the obvious choice and that's, that's how we've looked at it. Uh, it is that we, when we talk to the ADs, we determine who, what team is the host school or what school is the host school. And that usually that's how you, like for wrestling, we're Salem, Cambridge. For field hockey, we're Salem, Cambridge. But for football, we're Cambridge, Salem. So that's how we kind of identify who's the host school. And a lot of it comes down to, you know, in, in baseball this year, we merged, we, we are Salem, Cambridge, because we decided at the time we had a baseball coach, they did not. So we said that we would we would merge and we would be the host school. Um, the other the other consideration in doing that is that if like for us if a couple of years ago we obviously only had like ten kids for football so they they helped us out we we had the minor number so they became the host school so that's another another way of deciding who would be the host school. Uh, it has deadlines, so in the fall you have to have your application board approved by April 1st. Uh, winter is August 1st, spring January 1st, and then football is February 1st. We write out an application, we submit it to the boards. It, once it gets approved, then it goes to, in this case, the Adirondack League, and then they approve it. And for example, this year we decided to put baseball, ask baseball to be in the Adirondack League, not the Western League and they had to approve that in order for it to happen that way, which obviously they did. And once it's approved by all parties, it's submitted to section two and for approval, which honestly, once all the committees have approved it, it's merely a formality. Uh, this is the merger data for, so yeah, go ahead. There has to be, um, you have to get approval from the league you want to be in, not necessarily from both leagues, just the league That is in. correct, correct, yes. Uh, so this is the merger data from this year. The purple obviously is Salem, the orange is Cambridge. So if you look at our modified football team, there were seven kids that participated for Salem, 15 for Cambridge. Uh, just in case you can't see it, football at, at the JV varsity level was eight and 23. Uh, field hockey was an even seven and seven split at modified. At varsity, it was a 10 and four split in favor of Salem. Golf was three and two. Uh, wrestling, we provided 12, they were four, and then bait, our current baseball team is 12 Cambridge students and 14 uh, Salem students that's divided between varsity and JV. Uh, one other thing I wanted to make note of because it's come up a couple times this year uh, is the idea of athletic placement, which is finding a seventh and eighth grader that would be considered uh, their skill set tends that that would lend to a JV or varsity program or a seventh or eighth grader that would be just dominant in the sport they can be recommended to people call it test up and in order there's a whole process in doing this first of all they have to get written permission from the parents it's a form they sign it they have to get uh, permission from the doctor to make sure that their physical maturity would be able to handle uh, the rigors of a JV and varsity and then they have to pass a physical test where there's five tests that they would have to take in order to, and, and they have to meet the benchmarks at four or five of those. So in this, it's curl up, sit and reach, which is just a sit down, you reach over, it's just a length thing, uh, a one mile run, a shuttle run, and they have to do pull ups or right, right angle push ups. So it is a pretty rigorous uh, setup. Uh, we do have some kids that have passed it. Uh, and the most important part that, that everybody needs to know about this is that it is not meant to fill teams. So we don't have a JV softball team. We didn't have a JV boys basketball team. We don't have any JV teams for girls soccer. And you know, I've had a couple parents this year saying, oh, why can't you just test up a, a couple kids? 
that's not what the process is for. You are not allowed to just fill a team by saying, oh, we'll take that eighth grader, that seventh grader, see if they can pass the test. So that's, that's a common misconception because I think I've had a couple incidents this year where our parents have said, you know, just bring them up. And it, it doesn't work that way. Uh, moving forward, as, as we look forward, how do we, you know, things that are on my mind is how do we in increase student participation? You know, we saw the number, it's still 60% of kids are not participating in a sport. You know, one of the possible options, at least thus far, is this year when we didn't have a boys soccer team, we had two teachers that helped out and created basically a, a intramural soccer team. So they were able to play indoor soccer uh, during the season, so they were still, you know, exercising, getting to play soccer. You know, I know it's not the same as being on the boys soccer team and playing other schools, but it was something that we threw out there for them, which seemed to have a very positive uh, vibe throughout the school and through for those kids. The other thing is that in May, I know one of our gym teachers is starting basically a volleyball club. And there's kids that are going to play volleyball after school, uh, you know, in just a normal, non competitive, fun setting. But these are possibilities moving forward of maybe looking at intramural sports uh, and maybe a sport that we don't usually offer uh, to, to try to increase that participation. Uh, Another thing we would like to look at is how do we improve our facilities. I know our field out there, you know, if you've been out there, so field hockey especially, there's little dips all over the place. And that can be, from a field hockey perspective, that can be very dangerous as the ball, if it comes up, you know, you don't want to be hit in the face with a ball that hit kind of a hill and came up. So we are looking at, you know, how we can improve uh, those conditions outside. And finally, the last thing that I would like to look at is why do we not have a Salem Hall of Fame for sports? You know, we, we have been, Salem has been here forever and ever. And it has a rich history, and I just think that at this, it, it's time that we start to, to recognize these people that are part of our past. Any questions? All right. That was easy. So I, I guess I have, a, I have a thought more than a question. Um, is that I think that participation comes from successful youth programs. And I don't know whether the school, there's a role for the school to play or not in, um, you know, we, we have a lot of well-intentioned, myself included, parents who, um, who don't necessarily receive um, support or training. Right? I mean, you basically need to be able to fog a mirror to be a youth sport, youth coach, right? I mean. If you have a pulse, you can do yeah, it. Yeah, if you want to do it, you'll get it, right. And that's probably not enough, right? I mean, and, and I don't know what, um, I, you know, I don't know the best way. I don't even know if there's a role for the school to play in that. Um, I mean, I've thought about that a bit, but, right, youth sports are not part of school, but I think that when you look at, uh, and there's all kinds of data, right? I mean, there's actually some really interesting articles that everybody's interested that I'll email to you from, uh, so Norway, right? Norway is has won the most medals in the last two Olympics. They're like five million people, and they kill everybody else. And they have like 95% participation in youth sports. And they have these federal laws that dictate how they're gonna run youth sports. And most most communities in the US completely break those, right? We kind of go about it the wrong way. And, and I don't know, so, I, and I, but I don't know if there's any role for the school to play in that. I mean, we're at a school meeting, so. But I think that that's part of the <clears throat> answer to participation is you just need to get lots of kids playing, right? You don't need to be making all-star teams in fourth grade. You need to get every kid playing in fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And that's what keeps a kid playing. So, and, and, and I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, I worry a bit about, I kind of think of it as the Zarziki doctrine, because um, Don used to talk about it some of us, we need to offer more opportunities. And what you do is you just water down your, you water down your teams, because you've got, you know, you offer too many, too many opportunities, and then you don't get enough kids for any of those opportunities. And we struggle, even with some of our merge teams, we struggle with numbers. Right? True. And so that's, <coughs> I, I think that's, I think that's, that's uh, I mean, I worry actually a little bit about weightlifting and volleyball and other things that we want to try to lure kids in to do other, other programs, but then we water down our base of kids for the programs we already have. So anyway, so not so much a question, but I think right, we right. really need to focus on the, on the youth end and, and actually do that part well, well so that we have numbers later. For example, the volleyball club that's starting, it was, it was set up on purpose in May so the people that were already in sports 
would not it wouldn't water us down but it's still like i said it is an opportunity for these kids there's kids that are not playing sports that are now going to play volleyball <coughs> so i look at that as a positive and i and i understand your take you're right when it comes to youth sports you know i think that is the key you know that's the starting point and people need to have a positive experience and i know that doesn't always happen but you you keep holding out hope that it will uh, and a lot of these kids that are in our sports programs now have been in youth sports for years and years and years. I think if you look at the youth programs, wrestling and football are just two that I can think of. Like, you know, you have some of the same coaches helping with some of these things and they run the same plays from football from the time they're in flag all the way up right. to the varsity level. So I think you do see a big difference in those two programs because yeah. of the... Input from school. Well, even but it's those individuals really, right? I mean, it's, yeah, it just it takes that motivated. Well, and even in youth football, obviously Salem, Cambridge emerged too. So you're right. There is a great benefit to that. One of the things when you look at, and we've had some conversation, I think, individually, but some of the programs, um, when you look in some other communities that have strong youth programs, there you see that connection between, even if they're not running the league or running team. There's that strong connection between the school coaches and those youth organizations and coaches. Like, hey, here's some of our key plays, so that they're learning the plays or learning some of the drills. And and you know, can kids maybe some of the team kids can go and help out. One of the things we talked about is developing our coaches and having more depth in our coaching. And so I think that's also a priority for us that we've talked about is maybe often. How can we draw in some of the maybe um, younger people out there, people who have considered coaching but have no idea how to get certified, maybe just having a little you know, workshop on how to become a coach, what do you need to do, and then looking at how can we support the workshops um, for people who are interested and want to commit their time. There's a fine line that as we go along with the taxpayer funds and what you can do what, what you can, obviously, but I think how we involve our our coaches and our athletes um, in that process, I think when you look at other districts, those districts are very successful with their, their youth organizations because you see, um, you know, I'll use, and I mean, we're not obviously Clifton Park, but you see um, the Shen basketball team kids are at the Quebec camp running, helping run the camp. And, you know, the, so the, the younger kids are playing with the older kids. And I was just talking to uh, a baseball um, player today who's on JV, and he's like, you know, I always like to be with the older kids, and I've always, you know, it's a, it was a challenge for me to play on the varsity basketball, but, you know, it was great to be around the older kids. And, you know, like he was very inspired by you know, having those older role models. So, like, how do we, how do we work with our coaches and create some of those opportunities? I think. I think uh, that's like a really good point. You actually mentioned exactly what I was going to mention, is that we need to, um, we can utilize our older athletes, you know, to kind of tell these kids like why, you know, there might be good reasons for it. Because the thing is, is you know, there's all kinds of different things that can help out on this, um, but when the kids are being told by, you know, the school and the teachers and the coaches that, you know, oh, you should come and, you know, do this, well, they don't, they still don't know uh, how this could be of a good benefit to, you know, the students. Like, the students don't know how this could be good for them because um, when you have somebody who's actually you know, been doing the sport and they can come up to the kids and say, you know, this really helped me learn a lot about myself and it really helped me out throughout my life, you know, because you learned this and this, like, you know, so I'll use my personal experience as an example. I was never athletic um, and I started off with weightlifting, right, so that kind of got me into, you know, uh, sports in general, I guess, but, um, I had a friend who was a wrestler and you know I would have always looked at wrestling and said like you know I'm you know I'm not a wrestler you know and um you know he told me the re like some of the things that wrestling did for him and this was a kid who you know he was uh he had a lot of things that you know 
he'd been through and had to work through and things like that. And, um, you know, he told me, like, you know, you really learn a lot about yourself and things like that. So kind of taking from that, you know, it's really, um, I mean, it goes back to the open conversation, I think, and really opening these pathways of communication between every party um, so people can get more perspectives. I think that's important for kids, you know. And I, and I didn't put it in this presentation, but the, the turnover that we have in coaches is pretty significant. I mean, if you take wrestling out of the, out of the equation, uh, which obviously is doing great, and he's been there, you know, Frank has been there for many, many years. Uh, I don't think we have a coach that has more than three years of experience. And if we talk about these camps and building a culture, we need to find coaches that are going to be in this for the long haul, and we just we haven't, we haven't gotten that yet. Um, and that's something else we might want to look at, or I might want to look at, our administration wants to look at uh, moving forward is, is how we can find coaches that you know want to to do these things and want to be here for the long haul. Well, I think Julie's idea is great. I know Jacob Pelusha would love mm -hmm. to learn because he loves basketball mm -hmm. coach, but they don't know where to begin, how to even start. They're trying to take stuff home and you know, show them what to do. And, but, and if they are they not, have something. if they are not teachers, it's coaches. Yeah, and if they are not something if they are not teachers it is quite the process. Um, but, you know, in Jacob's case, tell him to contact me and I can send him all the information that he needs. Um, but I'm sure there's more. Right. Oh, yeah, there's a ton of things you have to go through if you're not a teacher. Yeah. I've had a couple, I've had a couple ask me this year, but just the process, is, it's not something that happens overnight. Right. And even the process, you know, so we have some of the younger kids who've recently graduated and I think um, have a lot of interest and potential, but... You know, it's it's a, a lot to yeah. run a team with kids that are just maybe five or six years younger than you. So it'd be great, you know, to be able to develop them and get them to the volunteer coach level so they can be mentored by other coaches. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are some of the things that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've had some conversations and uh, Will and I have had a lot of conversations with along with uh, Mr. Duty about, you know, uh, working with the coaches, uh, we're going to kind of really put together a coach's hand. I mean, there might be one somewhere, but we can't find one, a coach's handbook. Yeah, one um, from current staff. Yes, and so we just got a couple samples from some other schools and really looking at, so we have clear communication and expectations, and so coaches aren't frustrated and we have some process, and so that's going to take a little time, but, you know, we're aware that, you know, creating that culture is also how we work with the current coaches that we have, you know, storing equipment and making sure we have it available and the fields, you know, like those are, you know, they kind of seem all separate, but they all come together in the end. So. I think also with, with not, I mean, there's a huge difference between teacher coaches and non-teacher coaches, mm -hmm. right? And I think when you look at longevity, I'm sure there's a strong correlation between how long people coach for if they're a teacher versus if they're a non-teacher, but then also the needs of an orientation for, right, I mean, teachers just kind of know how the whole deal works, mm -hmm. right, and mm -hmm. they know how, what it is to work with kids, and they know, and, and people who volunteer are kind of excited about the sport, and, and I think they really need a lot more, um, a lot more of, a, of, of kind of an introduction and orientation right. to, mm -hmm. to so what we, is involved. So we'll talk about maybe doing, maybe having a workshop or something in the fall, and you know, if you're idea. interested in, you know, are you interested in kind of going through the process of your teacher or not a teacher? And One thing I, I think would be beneficial from personal experience with coaching is <clears throat> having like a universal fall, winter, spring, like meeting. Like parents are invited, students are invited, and everyone sits down like, you know, field hockey's here, football's here, you know, soccer's here. And you kind of go through, I know we check off like on the sports ID that you read everything, but I don't think parents yeah, they just really read everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really, <laughs> really <laughs> you don't read everything? <laughs> really? Yeah. That terms and conditions, right? You just yeah. like, yeah. Oh, you broke you know, our heart. But, but every, you know what I mean? And it's on the same day, parents are, right. student athletes are required to come. And you just, and you go over your own program. You know, what are your expectations? Mm -hmm. You know, when it coaches, like, you know, this is a dramatic practice, this is, you know, so it's kind of black and white, so there's, you know, and if we're all on the same page, um, you know, when
when there's issues with why don't we have this team, why isn't there that, it's kind of already addressed up front. Um, just a suggestion. That might yeah, be. and I don't know if that was ever done here, but I've seen that done in other yeah. districts mm -hmm. quite well, successfully. And as a parent of the seventh grader this year, like those things would have been really nice in the beginning, like the fall. Thank you very much, Mr. Moore, for putting that together. I appreciate it. I learned a few things, um, and I've been doing this for a while. Mr. I appreciate it. I'm just going to just add to the high school club piece. I'm just going to pass out. I think you're familiar with a lot of our clubs. I'm just going to give you the updated list of who I know um, Mrs. Eastman gives that out um, to you guys at the uh, Google time. Usually in the fall you get one, but in case you don't have that handy, who the advisors are. If it says NA, we're not currently running that club now. And um, we have those two clubs I know I've mentioned in the past that are not yet paid advisorships, so we kind of use this for a variety of uh, things just to kind of know who our advisors are, what level the clubs are at. So we have the chess clubs in its second year, so I have those in italics, and the Dungeons and Dragons club, which I mentioned to you earlier, which is in the first uh, year. So I think um, you know the chess club is still quite successful, and um, there's a, quite a bit of interest in that. I think um, you know it's kind of got me thinking about the numbers and how many kids maybe that are in sports or in clubs. So I think that's also, you know, obviously we want our athletics to be robust, but I think also just having kids involved in anything extracurricular is to their benefit. So um, possibly looking at that uh, in the future would be a nice thing to look at the numbers. But I, in the Dungeons and Dragons Club, they meet periodically. It's not a set schedule, but that seems to be going well. But I believe uh, historically after two years, is it? After two years in the past, two to three years, if a club seems to be um, really working, then we would possibly bring that to the board and have you know and talk to um, the association about that being a funded position. Uh, Mr. DeSoto and Mr. Eastman are um, you know, very happy to be piloting those clubs, and I think we could look at that down the road. Um, you know, both of those clubs are not do not. It require a lot of fundraising and a lot of funds to be had. It's really more activity than, than raising money um, for activities. So, um, you know, I think those are, are um, some nice additions and a little different. So I'll just let you kind of scroll, just look through there and see if you have any questions. I know you're familiar with many of these. The three highlighted ones are um, the elementary, our elementary clubs light blue and the rest of them are high school so I just wanted to let you oh and student council sixth grade that should have been highlighted down towards the bottom I apologize for that. so and if you have any questions let me know I just wanted to kind of just round out the extracurricular conversation you're offering a lot for kids <laughs> 7 through 12 anyways thank you So, yep. We have Dr. King for our special education. I sometimes yes. do. Mm -hmm. um, and can uh, Julie, I am terrible with technology. Okay. So, hold well, that. Let's see. We got to see. First, we've got to get your thing up there. So, this, um, once we get this on, so she'll. Just like on the light. So this, yeah, this is far to far the far right. Back. So this is forward. My back. experience with technology is I Check break it. So <laughs> if you press this, yeah. 
it's a little. Oh, no, no. <laughs> you want to get really fancy. Yeah. Right, we have the, we have the pros in here. <laughs> Thank so God, the yeah, dream team. Really a lot of work to bring Mark up this. I was gonna yeah. <laughs> I was gonna scare you a little bit and said mine was set to music I, with I an interpreted dance, but yeah. yeah. we won't do that. Well, you're gonna get those. I think I'm actually charged enough. I can take it down the trip line. Okay. Well, I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. I had um, several days and times here at Salem meeting with staff individually, with um, groups, and I think I learned a lot about how passionate people are about um, helping their students and about how much they really want to make things better for our kids here. So I'm not going to, I could talk about this all day and into tomorrow, but I promise you I won't do that because I'm also passionate about it too. Um, the purpose of this review was to really gather a lot of information, mainly from staff and looking at the data that's available. I wanted to look at the current special ed program here at Salem K-12, um, look, at, look at trends related to your special education data identify what's working and where you might need to um, pay a little extra attention. And then also after gathering all that information, digesting it, um, talking about it with people to really come up with a good list of next steps and what some recommendations might be. Um, as I said before, I met with people. I did inter individual interviews with each special education teacher and related service provider. I met with um, Patrick, unfortunately, just started when I came here, and half of the time when I wanted to see him, the poor guy was on the run, like all the time. And if I did meet with him, I asked him a question that he had to go and on the run to go find information. But um, I met quite mostly with Jocelyn and with Julie, who were both fabulous to work with. Um, I also um, attended faculty meetings at the elementary level and middle school and high school level to gather information, and those were fun. I'll explain what we did at those. Um, attended a few special ed department meetings to gather input and to share information. <coughs> and again, looked at whatever information was available, um, either on the state ed website, IEP direct, frontline, I, you know, reviewing IEPs and um, state reporting, your October snapshots for the past several years to see if thing, how things had changed or stayed the same. Um, I looked at classification rates because that's of course what we're, in our world, that's what we talk about. Oh my gosh, what's the classification rate in your school? And by that we mean how, what percentage of your students are identified as students with special needs. To keep things kind of equal, um, I often use the October snapshot data that is collected so that that um, is usually the second week in October in every school district across New York State the data is collected. So um, looking at the school districts in Washington County we're actually not that bad. Um, overall in Washington County there's an 18 percent average classification rate for all of the school districts in the county. We are right around 15% right now, and I know I can use this little pointer, 15%, um, which really isn't bad. I also wanted to look at what, how, how are the districts comparatively in, in terms of economically disadvantaged? And again, we are right there um, with a good, right, in, right pretty close to everybody else in the district, and our classification rate is better than almost all of the, the districts. Um, Putnam does not have any of those numbers um, figured in because their numbers of students are so small. If your cohort's under five students, they don't share that data. Um, I also looked at your costs. And overall, your costs per student for special education is in good shape compared to other districts. I could only really go from 2013-14 to 2017-18 and get good data. After that, they changed their reporting mechanism, and I don't know. 
Oh, it was horrendous. <laughs> I was going to all these different, said forget it. Um, but you are pretty good. You're doing things at a lower rate than other districts are. You're getting good bang for your buck. Um, you're not off the charts. You don't stand out that your expenditures are crazy. And I know that some years it can get out of hand um, or go above what your norm is depending on what the individual needs of a student or a couple of students are. But on the average, your um, expenditures are not <coughs> um, far from any norms. I also gave your classifications by grade level. You tend to have pretty even numbers. There are some pockets that are a little high. For example, this year, your third grade and your eighth grade are your higher numbers. But um, I also put a note down at the bottom. Looking at total classified numbers at a grade level is one thing, but then breaking it down. How many of those kids actually need special education teacher support? And how many of those kids are what I call RSOs, related service only kids, who get speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, but don't require special education at all other than those services? And this year, 20 out of 86 of your classified students are what I call related service only kids. So that really, that prompted some conversations with the related service providers that I'll get into a little bit later. And you do tend to see that the related service only kids are really um, primarily at the elementary levels. You often see that at the K-1 levels, kids come in who may be classified as speech impaired due to speech and language needs, and then become declassified later. Um, preschool numbers um, have stayed pretty stable. You don't have a lot of preschool students getting services right now. And um, there may be that, it may be that those kids upon transitioning to kindergarten, some of them may be declassified because very often a lot of the preschoolers are getting speech services. Um, and then when they transition to kindergarten, you look at is it really a disability or could we help that child with maybe speech improvement services? Um, other data that I looked at were the graduation rates for students with disabilities. And because your graduation cohorts have been so small, you, that number, those numbers really have not been reported. But I did pull some numbers. Let me just see here. Last year in your graduation cohort, you had um, six students who were classified. Um, and I looked at your four-year cohort, which did not give me a lot of information, and that's the number of students who graduate in four years. When I pulled your five-year cohort information, which a lot of our students do take a little bit longer at times to graduate, um, out of the six students in that cohort, you had one student graduate with a local diploma, three students graduated with non-diploma credentials, like a, um, a, CDOS, um, a CDOS or a SAC, and there were two dropouts, which I thought was something that you may want to keep an eye on, because in a very small cohort like that, we, we need to find out what's going on with those students. Um, in 2020, you had no students earning um, a local or a region's diploma. You had three non-diploma credentials and two dropouts again. And with, that was with five students in that cohort. So I think that's something we need to look at. The numbers are very small, but they're interesting numbers. And I think it might be um, interesting to find out what the barriers were for those students who did elect to drop out before completion. Um, so your dropout rate, again, I mentioned that. Suspension rate, you are not on any uh, bad list with state ed for over suspension of students with disabilities or disproportionality in um, classification or suspension of students of minority who were also students with disabilities. Placing students in least restrictive environment, and by that we mean having kids educated to the to the highest degree with their typical peers. Um, you're in pretty good shape with that. You're right near the statewide um, expectation for that. So overall, 
when I was looking at the data in terms of classification rate, you're among the lowest in the county. It's similar to the classification rate across the state in similar districts. Your pupil, as I said before, your pupil per pupil costs are lower than similar districts. Um, your classification rate, your pupil per pupil rate rose in 17-18, and again, that could, I believe there may, were, may have been some staffing additions then, and um, costs related to specific student needs. Out of district placements have decreased, and that's a good thing. You're educating most of your students within district. Um, you do have one student who remains on home instruction due to medical needs, and from what I understand, that student's needs are taken care of by on-staff people. Declassifications are another area I, look, I like to look at. Um, historically, there has been an issue where once you're classified, you're in forever. Um, I think districts are doing a better job, and I know Salem's doing a good job, at really reviewing whether a child still meets eligibility for classification when they have their re-evaluations done every three years, or um, even more frequently, especially in terms of those kids who are speech impaired. If they need only speech therapy, once they've met their goals, once their um, speech and language skills are at age appropriate levels, they don't need to really be classified anymore as long as you have that documentation to support that. Okay. Commendations. As I said before, the staff here was awesome. People wanted to talk. You have, you're fortunate in that you have people who have a lot of history here. You have some staff who have been here for years, who have seen things that have worked that have disappeared, who are very proud of things that are still working, and who have some great thoughts and ideas on how to make improvements here. <clears throat> Again, everybody was wonderful. Um, after having many discussions with Julie and Jocelyn, we identified some areas right away that we felt like, oh geez, these are some things that you could start working on now. Um, and they already did. They started working on putting some CSE processes and procedures together. Because what we found, what Jocelyn found when she came in, there was really nothing written. There were no written down processes, procedures, you know, things for staff to refer to. Um, in discussion with Julie, she incorporates the CSE information into the creation of her master schedule so that IEPs and the services that are documented in IEPs can be implemented, that they are reflected in the schedule. We did not find that at the elementary level. That was one of, poor Patrick. You know, he had just started and I said, hey, do you know where the master schedule is for the elementary school? I'll be right back. <laughs> and scurried around and scurried around. There is no master schedule. <coughs> so we used individual teacher schedules to kind of get the idea of, you know, how are we meeting IEP services? You know, but it was very difficult when, to do it that way, when you have shared staff, K through 12, when you have related service providers who, you know, can't pull kids from certain classes um, to do their services. Just the scheduling of the multiple things that you have in IEPs um, is very difficult when you don't have that master schedule to refer to. And at the elementary level, it becomes critical because you have, just as you do at the middle school level, but at the elementary level, you have teachers servicing two grade levels. So to be able to have them work between those two grade levels and make the schedules and IEP services work, it really helps to have that visual representation. Um, one of the things we talked about also was that there really was no good document that talked about your continuum of services. And by that I mean, what are the special ed services that are available K through 12? Does it flow smoothly? Does a service that exists for kids in elementary school still exist for them if they still need that when they get to middle school? And then does it carry through to high school, or is there a gap? Does a child who needs a special class reading program or ELA or math, if they can get that in elementary school, is that there for them in seventh grade? Or does it disappear until they become ninth graders? 
you know, those are some of the things we discussed and we discovered that there were gaps. There was not a really good vertical alignment in the continuum. And we also had the discussion, does the continuum that we think we have, does it really truly reflect the needs of the students that we have right now? Or was it something that's just been here and we've continued with it? So looking at the continuum, getting it written down, um, getting it really defined was another um, priority area that Jocelyn and Julie and I sat down and started working on together. And going along with that is what does it mean? Having descriptions for the programs that are in your continuum. You have two special class programs in district, but is there a good written description for what those programs are? What's included in them? What's the profile of the student that that program is developed for? Um, communication was an area that we talked about and Jocelyn developed a Google Drive where she put documents in for staff as she developed some CSE documents for, and began some of the procedures that information went in there. Um, we also talked about related service providers, speech, OT and PT, also having that as a great place where they could put resources for teachers so that they can carry over some of the um, skills they work on in the classroom. Also articles, um, state ed regs, all of that information that teachers have been asking for. Put it in that place where it's easily accessible to them. And when we get this work done of um, the continuum of services, program descriptions, those types of things will also be included in that. So it's at your fingertips if you're if you work here and want that information. When I went and met with, um, well, when I met with the special education teachers, one-on-one -on -one we talked about what's working. We talked about what needs improvement, what questions do they have. You know, some of that, like, what are the next steps type things. Any suggestions they had. You know, even if it was, like, well, we used to have this program 10 years ago, it kind of disappeared. I think we have kids who would benefit from that again. We had those discussions. And then a big piece that we talked about also is what do you need? What kind of PD would benefit you? What do you want? What's missing in your, you know, what do you need to help grow your skills? So we talked about this also with the gen ed teachers. When I met with them, we did a kind of a carousel type activity. I made sure that every sticky note I gave them was the same color. Everybody had the same color pen so you couldn't identify who was writing their notes. And people got to work as individuals with grade level teams, with their departments, and they really brainstormed together to talk about what's working. What did they really like about the special ed offerings right now in, in Salem? And where did they think that we had some needs? So in terms of what's working, the direct consultant teacher model that you have, people really felt positive about. They liked having those partner teachers working with them for whatever time of the day they had that support. They felt that it promoted collaboration, communication, and you really did have two people with eyes on those students um, and, and another person that you could bounce ideas off of. They really liked that with that model, Special ed teachers could also provide support for the kids who are really exhibiting those social emotional needs, behavioral needs in the classroom. They felt that in terms of additional aid support that you have for certain students or <coughs> students, they felt that was sufficient. They felt that they had access to the information that they needed. They had access to the IEPs, 504 plans, and that it was built right into your student management system was great. People were very complimentary about a meeting that was held in the beginning of the school year with the special education department to talk about you know, what, what it looked like this year. Jocelyn was new, but she talked about um, you know, the lay of the land for this year. And again, overwhelmingly, everybody said that there's a committed administration and staff, and really it is all hands on deck for your students here. So they're very positive about that. And even, and when I talk about what needs improvement, people weren't down about this. They, they were like, 
here's what we've identified. We need help with this. So when we get to um, what needs improvement or identified priority areas, I'm going to break it down into two areas, the special ed department and then the gen ed teachers. The special ed staff, and this is in the order that they gave it to me. They each got to check off priority areas. And it came out the development of the continuum was their number one priority. Then leadership. They felt that they really were missing having a dedicated leader for their department, that for the coordination, communication, and kind of that long range view of what was needed that was missing. They felt that they needed the development of processes and procedures. There was a lot of, um, they really weren't sure what to do at times. And some things had become casual over time. Like asking for a meeting could just be like, hey, we need to have a meeting on a kiddo. Without the paperwork filled out, why do you need the meeting? What is the backup information that you can give me so that everybody can go in kind of informed? Um, this is not really a special ed area, but it does impact area, impact special education. Right now, um, reported from special ed and gen ed, was they really didn't feel that there was a clear response to intervention process um, developed right now and in place. Professional development was definitely a high needs area. They felt not just for special ed, but for the gen ed staff also in terms of areas related to special education. And you'll see when I go to the gen ed part, they have a lot to say about that. Um, staff asked for assistance with learning more about social, emotional, and behavioral strategies. They also asked, um, one of their priorities was how to improve communication in the special ed department. And I think since this really became um, a hot topic when um, the previous special ed director left, and then different duties and responsibilities were spread out among different staff members. People really didn't, still don't know who to go to for certain things, even though I guess they've been told, but they don't, they're really not clear on that yet, um, on who to go to. Um, we were talked about before with the program descriptions to develop the criteria and learner characteristics for those services. And by that I mean, what does the profile of the student who receives direct consultant teacher support in ELA look like? Do they have reading deficits? What, are, you know, what skills do they have? What skills are they lacking in? What type of support might they need within that classroom? If they need a special class program, what is the profile of that student? Because we should be grouping students based on similarity of need and not just saying, oh, you need a special class? We have one, you're all going in there whether your needs are similar or not. But we really need to look at similarity of need and also learning styles and how that student benefits, um, what type of instruction they benefit from. There was a concern about IEP compliance. People were really worried about that. You know, are we complying? Are we implementing these IEPs as they're written? There are a lot of questions about how do I write a compliant IEP. Um, there was also some concern about curriculum materials for self-contained classes. <clears throat> that was not as um, high an area because I think there have been efforts, I think there's been some budget money since then put into buying some materials. Scheduling and common planning time were an area that they also had concerns about. And I know that can be difficult, especially because a lot of our teachers are shared between two grade levels. To have common planning time with both grade levels um, is often difficult. Gen ed staff priority areas were again, just like special ed, the special ed leadership position. They felt that, that there needed to be a leader for the department, that some people felt that it was taking away from their principal's time to have the principals <coughs> also sharing in that leadership. Um, they were looking for a clearly fine continuum. So what are the services that we have? What do they mean? How do you get into it? Who's eligible for it? Um, and that goes along with the clarification of roles and responsibilities. A lot of teachers had really good questions, like what is a consultant teacher? What does that mean? Is it the same as co-teaching? They had questions about 
can these services be push in or pull out? Um, who's responsible for implementing testing accommodations? Who's responsible for implementing any modifications that are in the IEP that we have to change instruction or change things how um, instruction is delivered? So there were a lot of questions about how to's um, and how can I learn about this and how can I become better at this? And is it my <coughs> responsibility? Um, improved communication and that, um, some of that was related to after a meeting was held, making sure that the communication gets out to the general education teacher. If something's changed in a student's plan, they want to know right away and not find out, whoops, when they haven't done something that has been um, put into a student's plan. Mm -hmm. um, professional development, they were looking for special education topics. They wanted to learn more about autism and autism-related disorders. They wanted to know specific instructional strategies. They wanted to learn the basics about IEPs and 504 plans. And one big area that they talked about a lot was literacy. How do I instruct the kids in my classroom who really have reading deficits? Like, what do I do at the high school level when a kid has a reading deficit? How can I best meet that kid's needs? Um, they also were looking at tiered interventions, the RTI and multi-tiered system of supports for students not only just in the academic areas of reading and math, but also with the SEL, social emotional learning and behavioral needs. And again, top with these, the, theirs are not ranked, but time to meet and plan and communicate with their special education partners was a really big piece for them. They're like, we are running all day long. We don't have time, we don't have shared planning. How can we make this work better? Um, when I asked, what questions do you have? <clears throat> the big one was roles and responsibilities, as I said before. What's the role of the special ed teacher? What's the role of the gen ed teacher in terms of implementing the IEPs? Continuum of services. What are the supports that we do have in district? Some people were not aware of, of a lot of the supports. Where can a service be located, push in or pull out? And I think this is a big question now because over the two COVID years that we've had, when there were all of the social distancing requirements, I know that in many districts, people were pulling their kids out to give them instruction when, according to the IEP services kids had, that service normally would have been delivered in a gen ed classroom. But I think there was a lot of pull out happening that probably shouldn't have been happening, but it was the only way to get your kids together when you're supposed to be six feet away from everybody else. Um, again, chain of command, who to go to. Um, Again, finding out what's the difference between an IEP and a 504 plan. You know, what makes you eligible for this one but not for this one. And then um, we don't have a lot of alternate assessment students in district, but people were really curious about it. What is the alternate assessment? What makes you eligible for that? What is it? And I think that's great that they want to know. Um, I think the more information for them, the better. Um, so some suggestions and recommendations, and these came from staff. Um, I did have a list of some possible ticklers for them to think about. Um, and some of them asked for training on how to work as a team, how to really create that partnership with your special ed teacher who's providing support in your classroom. You know, we often joke about it as special educators that it really is a dating and marriage type relationship. It doesn't always go well initially. There's sometimes you think it's going to go well and you have to work out um, for the gen ed teacher giving up some of that control in your classroom, um, you know, really joining in that shared relationship to benefit your students. Another topic that they um, had some concerns about were when a student has a one-to-one -one or a shared aid, how do they utilize them in the classroom? The gen ed teachers are like, do they just stand there? What can I ask them to do? Um, you know, it was kind of unclear to them what that person's role was in their classroom. For some of the students, they knew very clearly. If the student had a medical need or something, they knew that that person was there. Student, or if it was a student who had a very apparent need, they were clear. But other times, they're like, 
can I ask that person to do something else in the classroom? Can I ask them to assist with something? So I think just some support on that would be great. Um, they really are looking for also clarification on how to implement testing accommodations and program modifications. They would love training on de-escalation because they've seen an increase in students with social emotional needs. Um, kids who are a little explosive, you know, still struggling, um, or kids who weren't struggling prior to COVID have come back and are struggling. So they would really like that. As I said before, they're very curious about autism. Um, would love to learn more about that. Stress management, not only for their students, but for themselves. These are stressful times right now. And teaching is stressful at times also, even without COVID and all the disruption we've had. And again, addressing their reading and literacy needs. Um, the RTI and MTSS system, K-12, um, as I mentioned before, that's something that people felt really need to get going. Um, some of the elementary staff felt that they had it started at one point, but then COVID kind of interrupted things. And there have been staff changes also that have also put things on hold again, too. But they really want to get that going. They want to learn more about progress monitoring, how to collect the data, how to use the data that's collected to inform their instruction. And they really want to learn more about um, appropriate interventions to use with students who are struggling common planning time came up again, or just trying to find a creative way that they can meet whether it, if they can't do common planning time, could they meet quarterly, could they meet monthly with their partner teachers just to touch base and talk about, you know, units and planning and what, what's coming up. Because right now a lot of them are doing it on the fly. They're doing it the best they can. Many stay after school, lots of emails. Um, so based on all the information, and I know this is just kind of glossing over things, that you have a much more detailed report, um, the recommendations that came out of all of the conversations with staff were to reinstate the director of special ed position. Um, and I think that one position will help so many of the areas that were identified by the staff to improve and increase the communication across the district regarding students with special needs, um, you know, maintaining that ongoing communication. I think that the administration, the yeah, principals and Jocelyn have, have had really good communication, but I think to spread it out further and have it be consistent. Um, someone to really be on top of that continuum of services and having the pulse on the special ed population across the district from age three when you first get them in preschool to age 21 so that they can keep an eye on what the changing needs are of the district. You know, as I said before, sometimes you have something in place and it stays even though the needs of your students may have changed. But just to have that long-term view um, and I think having someone who can keep their eye on that three-year-old that they know in two years when they enter is an extremely high needs student, may need a very specialized placement, or if you can um, serve that child in district, may need a lot more support than we currently have here. So to prepare with pre-training for staff, perhaps make, having some special hires if you need a special type of support. Um, the CSE processes and procedures, I think that's a really critical thing to get in place. Um, the quicker the better. Um, professional development, this person would also be able to identify the PD areas that are really needed for staff. And so that happens through conversation, it happens through the observation process when you go in and you notice that, you know, someone's really struggling in a particular area, be able to offer them the PD that they need to really grow their skills. Staff support, right now I think the special ed team is working as hard as they can some of them were like, oh, please, you know, there's not enough chocolate in the world right now for me. <laughs> and I tried to supply as much as I could, but, you know, these people have been working really, really hard and they feel <coughs> that they need support now. Um, a big piece of clarifying those roles and responsibilities. I think very often we assume that people understand what the role of the special education teacher or the related service provider is. And what I was hearing is that they're really not clear on it. 
um, and also what their own role is. The gen ed teachers wanted to know what's my role in this. So I think the special ed director can help in you know, getting some of that PD out there for staff. Um, the scheduling piece is critical. The special ed director would work with the administration, making sure that the um, special ed needs are reflected in the master schedules work hand in hand to help them develop and implement the RTI MTSS system and also to keep a constant eye on staffing. Um, what are your staffing needs? Are we overstaffed? Are we understaffed? And again, that's always a moving target depending on the needs of your students. Communication and culture, this position also would help to improve that. Um, I used to always impress upon the people I worked with, that it's really important to have a no surprises. Keeping everybody informed um, is so important. Um, I think having the director there, improving the communication will help to really grow a respectful, professional, and collaborative partnerships in the classrooms. Some of the special ed teachers um, expressed that um, in some classrooms they felt like their expertise wasn't really respected, that their, the message was pretty much, you go over there, let me do the teaching, and if I need you, I'll let you know. But really, our staff has so much that they can share and they can um, enrich that learning environment. Also, by in increasing the communication and the PD, we can really help promote a culture of shared ownership. And by that, I mean, our students with IEPs, the gen ed teachers and, and special ed providers share in that ownership of the students. Sometimes you get the, the message that that kid with the IEP, he's your responsibility special ed teacher, I'll take care of the rest of the kids. And we really want to promote that shared ownership, that we are all in this together, we are all here for all of our students. Um, and the PD for a special education, I really feel that many of the topics would be beneficial district-wide and to try not to target some of the special ed PD just for special ed staff but to have it open to everybody. Um, one last thing for staffing, um, in my larger report that I had submitted I talked about the difference between teacher aides and teaching assistants especially in the elementary um, special class program right now I think if there was a teaching assistant, perhaps in the future in that classroom, you really could increase the instruction in that classroom. Teaching assistants may instruct under the direction of a special education teacher, where aides may not do instructional activities. They're there just for support, redirection, guidance, but not direct instruction, where a teaching assistant could help um, in, that type of, in that type of setting there could be two instructional groups going on at the same time. Um, I think a lot of this stuff could be really worked on starting now and into next year. And I think that next year, um, getting those RTI and MTSS processes and procedures in place, even though it's a general ed initiative, as I said before, it really impacts special ed because without the RTI process, procedures, interventions, referrals to CSE increase because kids have not had um, the interventions and supports that they really need, the progress monitoring. Um, as I said before, the hiring of the director of special education, if you choose to go in that direction, would really help take care of a lot of those issues that staff brought up. Um, some of these things that I've talked about will be ongoing. They, they aren't just a one and done. You're always doing, you're always monitoring your out of district placements, your high needs students. You're always trying to move kids to a less restrictive program or location. You're always monitoring program needs, your continuum of services and your procedures and, uh, you know, amending them as you need. Monitoring staffing is ongoing also based upon IEP recommendations. Um, I also shared with Jocelyn this year a process that I had used in a previous district for making your projections for next year. So at her annual review meetings that are held at this time of year, um, she has projection sheets that for each grade level that can be shared with guidance. 
so that when they're scheduling students, they're aware of the programs that are recommended for those kids. So she can look at, just at a glance at a page, how much speech therapy is needed at each grade level, how many students, how many individual <coughs> sessions, how many group sessions. So you get an idea of staff utilization there also. Um, let's see. Right now you have, you're contracting with an outside consultant to support um, an elementary program. You know, if you still, if you still have that outside consultant really um, doing ongoing evaluation of that. Is it needed for a specific need area? Is it still needed? Is there any way that, that those skills can be transferred to in-district staff so that you no longer have that reliance on the outside consultant? Um, identification and prioritization of PD. This is ongoing. The director and the um, administration would be doing this. And again, that big communication piece, which was really um, an area of need. Again, I, I know I've shared a lot with you. Um, recommendations, of course, that I've made. It's really now up to, <laughs> up to you to decide um, what priorities you would like to, to address. Um, the staff is committed. I think they're ready to get going on, on whatever we decide to move forward with. Um, and I think that the staff should really be commended. I think that Julie and Jocelyn jumped on some things right away. And, and I think um, that was great. They didn't wait for any of this. I brought some materials in and they're like, we want that, we want that, we want that, let's go. Um, so I think that's really commendable. And that's all. But I'm ready for some questions. And I do want to say, I, I was talking with Mark and with Jocelyn and Julie before, and what I did for another district was, after following this, developed um, some action sheets for them where we identified targeted areas under those priority areas, like under communication, what are we going to do? Under um, development of program descriptions and our continuum services, what are we going to do? Let's break it down into you know, manageable components. When are we gonna start this? What's our timeline? Who's going to be involved? If it involves any budget monies, where are those monies coming from? Is it general budget? Is it your IDEA grants? Is it the ERA money? Is it, or ARP, or whatever it is this time, ARP? Um, you know, where is that coming from? Who are the people who will be involved in it? And what, when do we expect to be finished with that? So kind of break it down in chunks. Um, my recommendation would be for some of these things, if you could, to get some summer work groups going or even some work groups before the end of the school year that could continue. And especially if you get a new director, this would be a perfect time for that person to establish some relationships with some of the staff and have that common work and common goal um, so that they can start the school year in a good space. Any questions? This actually isn't a question for you, but it is a question that I have as I was listening to you speak. We did have the director position in place. We moved mm -hmm. away from it. We're headed back. That It's in the budget. And is there a job description for that? And if it is, does it need to be taken out and put up against you know our needs now? Or do we need to, yeah. to develop that? Does anybody know whether we even have a job? Yes, we, ha we have a draft job description uh, to the personnel. Did I share that with you? I, I see I that. See, okay. okay. I, we that have would be one, important. Yes. Yeah. Mark, I'd be happy to get gather some other ones that I've gathered to share with you also. Yeah, we, we, we got a slew of them. Okay. So we did <laughs> gather them. Okay. Um, but we'll, we'll get those out. Just so that we're clear on yeah. what our expectations are and what we're asking somebody Correct. to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's a, yes, it is, it's in draft form. Okay. Yeah. And we did some simple changes and we compiled from around the area the, what seemed to make sense. So it's in draft form. Oh, good. Yeah, because it does vary from district to district. I know some of them ELL and some other, and guidance and some other support services also fall under. So it's a, you know, whatever you decide you want that position and I, to be. And to be perfectly honest with you, I would envision this being modified a year from now, oh, yeah. probably two years yeah. from now. Yeah. Because you're going to see yeah. some things 
don't fit. Yeah. Um, I think that I think that some of the work that's already begun would be a good jumping off point um, that could help you reach some of the other other key areas that were were identified. Right. The one thing we did notice right off the bat was the old previous one was not appropriate based on what what we've learned in yeah. a short amount of time. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very it's much. It's been a pleasure. Darlene, thank you very much. gives us a great framework to move forward with. So, a lot of information. <laughs> uh, moving on to our consent agenda. Does anybody wish to remove anything from the consent agenda? No? If not, uh, entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Motion by Ms. Dan. Second. Second by Heidi. Includes the minutes, treasurer's report, internal claim audit report, condition of accounts, CSE report, and the extra classroom quarterly report. Um, and all in favor, please signify by. We can all say aye or we can raise our hand. <laughs> motion carried 5 0. Thank you. Um, moving on to committees, I don't know if committees did have an opportunity to meet the, the finance committee meet. We did, we met, but it seems like it was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had talked about extracurricular cl clubs versus trust and agency funds and where those money should be and how they should be organized. And we talked about the Washington County COVID grant. Um, so we have about, we've utilized, so we originally had 108 thousand um, dollars and we've utilized about 14,000 so there's about 93,800 left um, for postage for nursing information for um, air filters purifiers those kind of things to continue so we're in pretty good shape still with the COVID funds um, and then we just had a quick update about where we stood on the um, capital project which hopefully a lot more got done I know they yes, got to they the have, nurse's office and things they, since they have that, done so. quite a bit what was the first thing you, you said about extracurricular? So extracurricular clubs versus trust and agency funds, like how those money should be organized, organized and put out. Yeah. So, and what it, what, so what was the conclusion? Karen, it's, it's not really a conclusion, it's how the um, clubs are handled. There's some clubs that are specific to the teaching and finance and they So no changes there, just no, the, and what what we found is there are more individual clubs who, who want to do some fundraising. For example, I believe we have a, a bas is a basketball organization that that would like to create some type of funding for certain things. What's the other ones we've talked about, Karen? Ba yeah, baseball. So, so we have a, a, a mechanism for them to do that. There's, there's some oversight. In, in, and most importantly, our auditors are comfortable with how we're doing it because that's a big area. So, so we'll be working at sharing that information with the individuals as, as more fundraising takes place. So I think it was a positive. It's a real positive. Thank you. Um, did the communications committee meet? We did not meet, uh, but we are planning to May 9th, I think it's the, the second Monday. Second Monday. Right. What time are you guys meeting? Okay, so we're meeting at 6. So perfect. Back to back, there you go. <laughs> and the policy committee did not meet, but it sounds like in our future 
Uh, there will be a you, meeting you, for the uh, poli I'm assuming if there's going to be policy changes for the open meeting law. How we yes need we, to we have a few things for the policy committee oh, okay. to just ponder. So we won't okay. put you to work. Okay, <laughs> we, we've sort of been coasting. So yeah. I suppose it's our our yes. turn. Okay, very good. All right, moving on to to um, action items. We have some personnel. Uh, items that we need to um, to handle. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve um, the coaching resignations as presented. We have uh, Tyler Clark and Mark Eastman, Tyler from Varsity Baseball and Mark from Modified Baseball. So uh, motion by Heidi, Second. second by Bob. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand or saying aye. Motion carried, 5-0. Entertain a motion to approve the following coaching appointments, and that would be Mark Eastman for Varsity Baseball, Tyler Clark, JV Baseball, and Matt Parker for Modified Baseball. So motion by Heidi. Second. Second by Jackie. Any discussion? No? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. I think I'm just more comfortable. I, okay, that way I can see it and I can have to hear who's doing it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, motion carried 5-0. Entertain a motion to approve the resignation for Gail Shaw for the purpose of retirement. Do we have to? I know. <laughs> she, she has earned it. <laughs> motion by Heidi. Second by Dan. Um, she has put in how many years, do you know? Um, does it say on here? No. No. Uh, we know. She's been here a long time. Yeah. I believe she wants the sub too, though, doesn't yeah, she? Does. Yeah, it's yeah. coming up. It's coming yeah. up. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. That's good. Um, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carried five zero. She deserves it. Retirement's a good gig, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, now moving on to. Here her name comes back again. Entertain a motion to approve uh, the following substitute appointments. Uh, Stacy Parker for as a substitute teacher, Gail Shaw, substitute teacher aide, and Mr. Cronin as elementary <laughs> principal. <laughs> Yay. Yes, and we have some cake for Mr. Cronin. <laughs> <laughs> I have a motion. <laughs> the, cake the, the cake gotcha, I know. <laughs> Distracted. Motion by Heidi. Uh, a second by Jackie, thank you. Right there you go. <laughs> All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carried 5 0. Um, if there's no objection, I'd like to combine the next, uh, I think it's five items. One, two, three, four, five, um, four non resident students. Um, Anybody wish to have any of those removed? No. Uh, entertain a motion to accept the requests for non resident student waivers uh, as presented. So motion by Heidi. Second. Second by Dan. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carried 5 0. And if I could just I make a six of those. Six, I'm sorry. Yes, as presented. So. Oh, the I see. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just a quick comment. We were, I'm involved in the Washington County Listserv, a number of school districts, all of the school districts in Washington County. We've talked about this. And Salem has by far the most number of, of employees bringing their, I mean, their, students? their students to Salem, which I think is a real positive reflection. Um, so I, I, I commend you for doing that. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay. uh, entertain a motion to approve the request from Daryl Holovach for an unpaid one-year leave of absence effective July 1st, 2022. So motion by Bob. Second. Second by Heidi. Any discussion? No? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carried. 5-0. Best of luck with your your program. So, uh, yeah. you know, we look forward to your return, young man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he, has to, he has to turn in a, a valuable personal item so that he can come back for it. So, best of luck. All right. 
Um, moving on to scholarship approval. Entertain a motion to approve the establishment of a one-time Melissa Craft Memorial Scholarship. So motion by Heidi. Second. Second by Dan. Any discussion? When is this one time? Just one. Just for this year. Just for this year. Okay. Um, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carried 5-0. Um, we do have some money business to take care of. And yeah, yeah, some big money. Entertain a motion to fund the Capital Reserve Fund. And as presented, we have the Capital Reserve Fund at 1200000 the Insurance Reserve at 78000 and the TSR Reserve at 27000 Motion by Heidi. Seconded by Jackie. And this just happens to be the unappropriated fund balance that we have in 2021. Any further questions or concerns? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carried 5-0. Uh, we do have two BOCES. They need to be separate, I think. So, yes. yeah. Entertain a motion to vote for the six candidates nominated to fill uh, the BOCES Board of Education seat. They have eight openings, but they have six candidates. So. We need a motion, and we, then we'll vote then, on the yeah. okay, so Second. Motion by Bob, seconded by Heidi. So, you, do you need to roll, have a roll call for us on that one, or no? Um, I don't know. I have not. We did no. not do it that way. No, you don't need. We a, don't need a roll, roll call, call on that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So all those in favor of the six, voting for the six named candidates, please raise your hand. Motion carried 5-0. Um, and entertain a motion to approve the 2022-2023 BOCES administrative budget. Motion by Heidi. Second. <laughs> Second by Dan. <laughs> Heard that one first. Um, do you need a roll call on this one? No. 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 Okay. No. All right. Um, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carried 5-0. Um, if, if there's no objection, I'd like to combine the next two, two items. Entertain a motion to approve the first, for the first approval for Janet Middleton's summer 2022 classes and approve the field trip request for Amy Maxwell for the Educational Trip 2022 New York State FFA Convention. Motion by Bob, second, second by Heidi. Um, any other questions or concerns? No? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carried 5-0. <laughs> Thank you. And we did have the one addition uh, oh, yes. to, to act on. Motion to approve the Salem-Cambridge Wrestling Camp from July 24th to July 28th, 2022. Motion by Heidi, second by Bob. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carried, 5-0. And now we have some import, other important, we have a lot of important business tonight. Um, moving on to some tenure appointments. So this is exciting for us too. Entertain a motion that upon recommendation of the superintendent, Dory Flint, who holds a professional certification in childhood education, grades one through six, he is hereby granted tenure in the elementary education tenure area, effective on September 1st, 2022. Motion by Bob. Second by Jackie. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carried 5-0. Entertain a motion that upon recommendation of the superintendent, <coughs> Rebecca Quinn, who holds a permanent certification in special ed education area, is hereby granted tenure in the education of children with handicapping conditions, general special education tenure area, effective on September 1st, 2022. So motion by Bob, second by Heidi. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carried, 5-0. Rebecca, you. thank you. <laughs> Um, entertain a motion that upon recommendation of the superintendent, Bridget Thomas, who holds a professional certification in speech and language disabilities area, 
is hereby granted tenure in the speech remedial tenure area effective September 1st, 2022. Motion by Bob, second by Jackie. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carried 5-0. Entertain a motion that upon recommendation of the superintendent, Zachary Eastman, who holds an initial certification in the music area, is hereby granted tenure in the music tenure area effective on September 1st, 2022. Motion by Bob. Second. Second by Jackie. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carried 5-0. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was a there was a I was I know. A little bit more. Yeah. 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 I figured that's on. That's on. Like, <laughs> and so people know we've invited these four people to uh, our board meeting next month. We'll have a, a brief reception. Have your principals introduce them. More cake. More cake. More cake. More cake. <laughs> if, and, and we're not letting that out. There's a possibility we're going to have cake. <laughs> More. Depends on how much Mr. Cronin takes home with him. <laughs> I think he's doing his other eyes on that. I don't know. <laughs> well, that, that was good. Um, actually, just moving on to opportunities for the board to be heard. Um, there was just one thing I wanted just to bring out. It's not anything I think we have to take care of right away, but there, was an, there were two articles. One had to do with the Opens Meeting Law, which we've already talked about. But also in the paper, there was in the budget. There's um, a movement towards um, electric vehicles and electric buses, and having schools be ready to have those buses at least begin the buses in 2027. Correct. So, so I know that there's going to be some infrastructure. I don't know a lot about it, but I'm just interested in knowing more about it. So I just wanted to put it out there that yeah. you know it might be something for us to yeah. take that long-range look. Yes. Uh, um. The good news, they are environmentally safe, better. The bad news is the buses cost about three times yeah. of, of the traditional bus. Yeah. So they're apparently, it, this is a big, we're kind of surprised that it got pushed, pushed through. Yeah. So there's strong support, um, obviously, with the legislators. So um, the, hopefully there's going to be some grants and yeah. some incentives, but uh, it's not going away. I mean, just what does that entail? I just don't, and five years is not that long if we have to do some believe, structural things. Believe it or not, the business officials across New York State are very concerned, very conservative, and there, there's a strong push to, to phase this in over a period of time. Yeah. Um, so I, my guess is that it's going to happen, but I think it's going to be, a, there's going to be a somewhat of a phase in. Um, but, but I know um, Karen and Joe are aware of it. I get information. I funnel it to, to the two of them. So, so I'm sure we'll have a plan in place um, 2027 and before. But we have to stop mid run to church. Well, the county's going to it also, so our plow trucks are also going to be electric. All <laughs> wheel <laughs> trucks are going to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's coming. Yeah, it's, it's coming. coming. It's coming. Yeah. What's that? Now Just you're going to afford to go anywhere. Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, they it, sell trucks that can run your house if the generator hooks up and everything. Mm -hmm. But, like, $90 a month. Yeah. 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 So I'm just interested so, yeah. in knowing more. Yeah. You know, just we'll putting you know. Yeah. Yeah. Is there We're all going to be at Stewart's plugging our cars. Car. <laughs> if we can afford to buy the car to plug it in. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. There you go. So I'm, is there anybody else that has yeah. anything that they'd like to bring up? or? No? All, right. Okay. all right. And we have some dates to remember. We do have our budget hearing coming up um, on the 10th. May 10th. And May 17th is, um, that's our election yep. and budget vote. And <laughs> June 15th, last regular Board of Education meeting for the 21-22 school year. Wow. We'll have to have cake at that one. Too. Can we that's have cake the there too? Have to Three cake cakes in a row? Yes. I think, we should. Yeah. I think it's definitely worthy. If you're yeah. fortunate, you might have a couple of special meetings. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. 
And at this point in time, I'd like to open the floor up again to if there's anybody here who has anything that they'd like to share with the board or questions or concerns. No? No public comment? Well, thank you for attending. We, it was nice to see some faces out there, so thank you very much. Okay. And at this point, entertain a motion to move into executive session for the discussion of the employment history of a particular person. Motion by Heidi. Second by Jackie. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion, okay. Motion carried 5-0. We'll, we'll go down the DL room and we'll be free. Yeah. Did you want to, this was what you had shared with me. Do you want that back? Okay. All About. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we talked about it a little bit last time. We're working on a couple things, and we talked about, I was saying, even like, like I bring Annabelle, and I don't know if she's been sticking to it, but before break, I was, one day she was like, I'm a little cranky, I'm trying, you know, and she, and I bring her my. Test, test, testing, testing, test, test, testing, testing, test, test, testing, testing, test, test.